All right, let's move into spore-based probiotics and why you're a fan of yeah. these. So, you know, what I, I liked about spore-based, and we pioneered spore-based probiotics, right? So uh, what's interesting is prior to us launching them, uh, this, this category of spore-based probiotic didn't exist. We, we created the category, essentially. Um, and to give you the, the short version of the story of how we came about this, the, the idea was, you know, I'm always looking at evolutionary biology for cues as to what we should be doing from a supplement nutritional perspective, right? So when it comes to bacteria, this, that's, that's even more important because I was trying to look at, okay, what is our natural relationship with microbes, right? So when we are in utero, we get some inoculum from mom's gut bacteria. In fact, dendritic cells reach across, pull certain bacteria from mom's gut and take it to the baby in, in, in the amniotic fluid and through the core blood. So you get some inoculum. Then when you're born, you get a huge inoculum passing through the birth canal. You get inoculums from skin to skin contact and you get inoculums from nursing. All right, nursing provides lots of different microbes. So that's all within the first like year-ish of being born. That's the majority of microbial exposure. But then the next subsequent years and the rest of your life, your exposure is through the environment, right? And if you think about uh, an interesting feature of babies, and this is something that I've always uh, thought about and a lot of thought experiments on, is, is babies have a tendency to put everything in their mouth right? They sample their environment with their mouth. They try to figure out the world around them with their mouth. And that's a weird behavior because as, as a species, our mouth is not a sensory organ for us, right? We are tactile and visual and we might smell things. We might listen to things, right? We don't, if we're trying to figure out what's in a gift, for example, we might shake it and listen to it. We might smell it, right? We look at the shape. We don't lick it to try to figure out what's in the box, right? And so, when you think about, well, why do babies have this natural tendency to put everything in their mouth? Well, it's because they're inoculating their system with the environment, which is so important for the development of their microbiome. So if you think about an ancestral baby is born, is put in the dirt, it's putting rocks and dried dung and dirt into its mouth, right? So that's a diversification of the microbiome early on. So then it becomes really clear that what's very important for the function of our microbiome is engagement with the outside environment. Now, when you look at most microbes in the outside environment, most of them don't function as a true probiotic because most of them will get killed in the gastric system, right? And you're getting the debris and the debris is engaging with the immune system and so on. But what if there were microbes that actually have a natural capability of surviving through the gastric system and they're in the outside environment? Are they the true probiotic, right? And so that's what we went in search of. And that's why the spores come in. The spores are so interesting because they're ubiquitous in the environment. They can exist in the environment in that spore state, which is a suspended state. They are not metabolically active. They're not multiplying. They can sit in the dirt for millions of years, literally millions of years. Then you consume them, and that spore state allows them to survive through the gastric system. But the moment they hit your small intestine, they come out of the spore state, and they start functioning as a functioning probiotic in your system, right? And they're designed by nature to be able to do this. There's very, very few microbes that can survive the gauntlet of the gastric system, right? Because it's designed so specifically to kill microbes. And here is a natural microbe that nature has given the ability to survive through the gastric system. And our system, our, uh, our immune system on, in our gut recognizes them as friend because they don't trigger inflammatory responses in the gut as well, right? So those are very important features. And we said, okay, these must be what nature intended as probiotics. So let's study them a little bit more. Let's study the impact they have on the rest of the microbiome. Let's study the impact they have on the immune system, the tight junctions, the leakiness in the gut, all of that. And we ended up publishing about 18 studies on the spores showing that they have a very, very uh, huge impact on the health of the microbiome. And when it comes to the spores, we're talking about supplement form here in general. How, in a general sense, would we engage with them if we weren't taking a supplement? Yeah. Like, do they come in on different types of food, being in different environments? Basically, up to this point of having access to these supplements... How much engagement did humans have with spores day to day? 
Yeah, we had we had a ton. So so spores in the outside environment. If you take almost any sampling of natural soil, uh, you'll see spores at the at the rate of around ten to the four, ten to the five CFUs per gram. Right. What that means is so ten to the four is around a thousand colony forming units per gram. Ten to the five is about ten thousand. Right. So uh, so if you go just go out and you 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 take one gram of dirt, which is not a lot, it's a tiny amount. You've got about four to five thousand live active spores in there. So there's a, quite a bit in the outside environment, right? In rivers and streams, dirt on, on vegetation. If you pick fruits from the tree naturally and eat them, they'll have spores on them. So, so we are designed, we evolved in an environment with these organisms. And we created this amazing symbiogenic relationship. So there's a process called symbiogenesis, which is where when two organisms are forced to exist in the same environment, eventually what happens is they develop a symbiotic or mutualistic relationship because it's better for the two, uh, two organisms to work together than work against each other, right? So because spores are ubiquitous in the environment, we have the symbiogenesis where we ended up providing them a home. Our immune system recognizes them as self, and so it doesn't attack it. Our, our system recognizes them as self, so they, we provide them a home that's not hostile to them. And in return, they clean up the home for us, right? So they do this amazing thing of fixing the gut microbiome. They use something called quorum sensing. Spores have this ability to go into a microbial environment and then read the rest of the chemical signatures of the microbes and figure out who's there and in what amounts. And then they can do specific things to bring down the growth of pathogenic and dysfunctional organisms, and they will do things to increase the growth of beneficial bacteria. We did a study that we published, um, I think in 2021 or 22, where we showed adding spores to a gut microbiome in three weeks increased the diversity of the gut microbiome by almost 25 to 30%. And it increased the growth of keystone species, which is critical, and it brought down pathogens, right? So the spores are like the police or the orchestrator of the microbiome. They do it better than we can do it. So that is the nature of the mutualistic relationship we have with them. We ate them all the time, inadvertently. We gave them a home. We said, hey, you can, you're, you're welcome here. We're not going to attack you. We're not going to be hostile to you. Uh, when you enter the system, and in return, you need to make sure you fix and manage the system for us. And they're te they're temporary; they're transient. They'll stay there for a couple of weeks, and then they defecate out, and they go back into the environment. And that's how they find a new host. You mentioned how common they are in the environment, so it gets me thinking about the advantage of supplementing. Is it that it's so concentrated? Is it that there are different types within the supplement than we'd encounter day in day out in the dirt on produce? Talk about why that's important to supplement. Yeah, so the concentration is important, right? It becomes really hard to ensure you're getting the right clinical dose of the spores if you are trying to go out there and methodically expose yourself to nature, right? It's different if you lived in nature, right? If you lived on the side of a mountain in a hut and all that, I would say you don't need any spore supplementation because... 24 seven, you're in the environment, right? So you're getting enough dosing. But if you're trying to be prescriptive about it and you go, okay, I'm going to go out and go for a hike and walk two or three times a week. We don't know if you're actually getting enough exposure to be clinically beneficial, right? We know it's going to be generally beneficial to you, but if you have a, a, a gut issue, is that going to be therapeutic enough, right? Um, it's beneficial for your gut, but not necessarily therapeutic. So in that case, supplementing with a defined clinically relevant amount becomes really useful. The other thing is the versions, right? So there's lots of different kinds of uh, bacillus spores you'll file, find in the environment, and not all of them are perfectly suited to function as probiotics in the gut. In fact, the spores that we worked with and we developed, we isolated them from human stool, right? That's where they came from because we wanted to find uh, versions of the spores that we're living in the gut for periods of time. So we know that they're better adapted for the gut environment. Even then, through them, we screened thousands of these strains to find the ones that had the most viability and the most functionality in the gut. So when you take it a supplement form, like in the, in the product Megaspore, what you're getting are the perfectly dialed in strains 
that have all of the spore features that are important, but are also very well um, evolved to exist in the human gut, right? And because some of these spores will live in insect guts, will live in worm guts, will live in other things. And so you may not have one that is as functional or viable in the human gut. Um, and, and what you get in the supplement form is, is that perfected. For somebody taking Megaspore, eating the diet we recommended, living the lifestyle you talked about before, is there any other adjuncts? You mentioned again, Floristore and another, I forget the other one, but another probiotic. What I'm getting at is if we apply the Megaspore plus the diet, plus the lifestyle, anything else as adjuncts we want to put in supplement wise, probiotic wise to fully balance that out? Or does Megaspore have everything we need? So Megaspore will have most of what you need. I would, I would look at strains that are specific to specific conditions beyond that, right? So for example, the, the strain we talked about, the Biflongum 35624. Um, if you have IBS and IBS-like symptoms, I would add that in because that, that strain is very powerful at controlling IBS-like symptoms and neural inflammation in the enteric nervous system. If you have anxiety, if you're someone that has a lot of stress and anxiety, I would add in Biflongum 1714, which is a psychobiotic that's very powerful at reducing anxiety and reducing stress. We know that stress and anxiety can have a, a dramatic negative impact on the gut. Right. So I would add that to the routine with the mega spore and so on. Um, I would also add polyphenol supplementation because you can get a good amount from your diet. But if you're really trying to ramp up your acromancia, your keystone species, heal that leaky gut, I would supplement with polyphenols for a period of time. Um, Floristore, I would add that in if you have SIBO. Uh, I would add in um, if you have fungal overgrowth, if you suspect that you have candida. Uh, for example, I would add in the floristore along with the spores, right? So, so it's specific to specific conditions. So, for example, if you're a woman uh, and you have a lot of vaginal dysbiosis, right? You get a lot of BV, you get a lot of yeast infections. I would add uh, there are certain lactobacillus strains like um, uh, lactobacillus crispactus or rhamnosus GR1 that have studies that show that oral intake of these microbes have a profound effect on the vaginal microbiome, right? So, so you can absolutely add those in for those specific conditions. And we're just talking about general gut health to maintain a healthy gut, diversify, uh, you know, keep leaky gut at bay. The spores and those other things that we talked about in combination are, are very powerful and powerful enough. All right, last question for you. We've talked about the Megaspore. I've worked with Just Thrive before, and I know you've worked with them in the past or are still working with them, you can clarify. But there is a slight difference in the formula between those two products. Very similar. I can't comment on concentrations, but the actual spores and different components within the product are very similar, except for one, one piece. Yeah. Talk about the difference between those. Is there a big difference in efficacy? You know, no, this, uh, we've, we've actually done a couple of small studies to, to bridge the gap there to see if there's a difference in efficacy in the most important functions like, like leaky gut, for example, right? And modulating inflammatory responses in the gut and improving the microbiome. We don't see any, any measurable difference between the two in that regard. Um, the, the fundamental difference is the presence of a strain called Bacillus lycniformis. Uh, Bacillus lycniformis is a really interesting strain because it, it produces antimicrobials in the gut to ward off certain pathogens. Um, and, and that can have some die off effect, right? And the reason why we formulated Just Thrive without it is because certain people, a certain percentage of people that take it, if you have lycniformis in there and you have pathogens, you're going to get a lot of die off. Uh, symptoms. You're going to get a lot of cramping, bloating, discomfort. It's a, it's a good sign that things are moving in the right direction. But for consumers who are not working with a practitioner, that can be alarming, right? And if you're working with a practitioner, the practitioner would have warned you and said, hey, you, you have SIBO, you've got a dysfunctional gut, I did a stool test, you have a lot of pathogens, you're going to get some Herxheimer or some die-off response. So let's manage it, right? So, that, so a practitioner can talk you through it. We didn't want consumers taking it and a percentage of them getting all these issues and then discontinuing it because they think it's a bad thing. So that's the main 
difference is the presence of that lichniformis uh, and the specific antimicrobials that it produces. Now, if you're somebody that's listening to this and you go, oh man, I have, I have a lot of pathogens in my gut. Maybe you've had a gut test at some point to know that, um, or you have any other indication, then the megaspore would be very useful, but know that you probably will have some die-off response. Um, for, in terms of maintenance and, and improving your gut, and sealing up the leaky gut, having a healthy, you can do the Just Thrive and that's perfectly fine, right? And uh, And in fact, that's, Typically, what I use for maintenance myself is the is the Just Thrive as well. And are you still working with both companies? Um, so I, I've spoken for Microbiome Labs uh, up to about the end of last year. I don't have any speaking engagements with them this year, uh, but I do have some speaking engagements for Just Thrive as well. Uh, I do a system with some you know uh, ideation work, and then I do some talks for them as well. Okay, obviously you believe in the products and. You're a scientist working with these companies, but just for full transparency. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm I was a founder of Microbiome Labs, right? Uh, so, so I founded the uh, the organization and and the, and developed the technology. Uh, was was very happy to to find an opportunity to, to sell that off to a larger biotech company who's going to take it to the next level. Uh, and then I also had other endeavors that I wanted to pursue and other problems to solve. Uh, and through that building of Microbiome Labs, we partnered with the founders of Just Thrive, who wanted to take this technology to the retail space. Um, so that was how we partnered with them. Nonetheless, my biggest position with both of those now is I'm a customer. You know, I, I actually buy the products just like anyone else off, uh, from retail sources, or uh, if I'm buying Megaspore, I'm buying it from a clinician. Um, you know, I don't get any uh, special deals or anything. The Just Thrive folks have been kind to send me a, a number of free bottles uh, for helping them with with some interviews and so on. But I I use those every single day. My family uses it every single day. My kids use it every single day. You know, uh, we're we're now customers and users of the product. If you enjoyed that clip, you're gonna want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. Adding spores to a gut microbiome in three weeks increased the diversity of the gut microbiome by almost 25 to 30%. And it increased the growth of keystone species and it brought down pathogens. So the spores are like the police or the orchestrator.